Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back to Great Texts. Today we're talking about John Dewey's Art as Experience, Chapter 4, The Act of Expression. Okay, now this chapter, as you can probably intuit from the title, really focuses on the production of art. Okay, what the artist is doing uh, when they are producing art. Um, and I want to start off uh, with a quote Dewey gives us from uh, Samuel Alexander, who's a um, late 19th and early 20th century British philosopher, um, a student of the British idealist T.H. Green. Um, he was also a psychologist as well as uh, uh, doing a lot of work in speculative metaphysics. And uh, Alexander wrote a book, Art and the Material, uh, and Dewey quotes from this book uh, early on in the chapter. Um, so here's that quote. And uh, let me zoom in on that. Uh, Alexander says, the artist's work proceeds not from a finished imaginative experience to which the work of art corresponds, but from passionate excitement about the subject matter. The poet's poem is wrung from him by the subject which excites him. And uh, uh, this is quoted on page 70 of Art's Experience. So here, you know, the contrast Alexander is uh, setting up is one that's crucial to Dewey between um, the idea that art just sort of springs fully formed from the imagination um, versus the, the, the idea that it instead begins in um, passion or excitement. And Dewey talks about impulsion. That's where that um, idea is going to uh, be seen in Alexander. Now Dewey says he's going to hang four comments on this uh, passage. And, uh, and here they are. Right? Uh, first, Dewey says the real work of art is the building up of an integral experience out of the interaction of organic and environmental conditions and energies. Second, the thing expressed is wrung from the producer by the pressure exercised by objective things upon the natural impulses and tendencies. Third, the act of expression that constitutes a work of art is a construction in time, not an instantaneous emission. And fourth, when excitement about subject matter goes deep, it stirs up a store of attitudes and meanings derived from prior experience. Okay, so if we focus on this first comment, uh, which uh, Dewey tells us is a terse summary of the point of view laid out in the first three chapters, we see that it encapsulates two uh, of the key ideas from uh, the earlier chapters of the book. So the first is this idea of the organism environment interaction that produces an experience, um, what you might also describe as the transaction between the live creature and the world around them. And then also you get uh, this notion from chapter three that uh, a complete experience or an experience has a structure of a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? You think about this in terms of the new vocabulary from chapter four, uh, you see that um, the beginning is, uh, is what Dewey calls um, an impulsion, right? Uh, it begins in an impulsion. And there's some kind of struggle or work or inquiry or process of creation. Uh, uh, that's the middle. And then you have an integration uh, and, a, and a kind of conclusion that culminates at the end. Um, so not just any kind of conclusion, but a special kind of culminating, integrating conclusion. Now, the second point Dewey raises is um, this idea that, that the thing expressed in the act of expression is wrung from the producer by the pressure exercised by objective things upon the natural impulses and tendencies. This really captures a lot of what is particular to this um, chapter, and so I'm going to go go through the ideas in detail, right? So 
Dewey defines an impulsion at the very beginning of the chapter. He says all experience begins with an impulsion. And he describes impulsion variously as a movement of the organism, a craving, a turning towards. Um, he says it begins in need. He describes it as a discharge of energies um, in some cases. So it's clear that impulsions have some kind of end, something they're directed towards. Uh, it may be subconscious, it may be uh, very inchoate, but there's, there's, there's a movement and it's a movement towards something. Right? Now, if the impulsion is acted on immediately and it finds its end, then that's it. It doesn't necessarily register in a conscious way um, or have any sort of further meaning. Um, you know, in the case of an impulsion uh, that comes from uh, hunger, right? If, uh, if the food is so immediately available that you don't have to do anything to get it and consume it, then um, there's, there's nothing to do. There's nothing to think about. There's nothing, um, and there's certainly nothing to express, right? Um, if your impulsion is a, is, a kind of, um, is a kind of feeling of grief, and what that leads you to do is just sort of cry out, tear your hair, weep, you know, there's no filter, um, there's, there's no sort of direction to it, it's just the immediate outpouring of feeling, then, you know, then that's all it is, right? Um, it's just an impulsion that's immediately sort of dissipated. Uh, or, or let out, right? I mean, even then Dewey tells us that, you know, from the outside we might call it an expression um, in the sense that, um, you know, we, we may say that a, that a baby that's crying is expressing uh, its, its um, discomfort, but it's not, it's not expression in the sense of um, an intentional or conscious expression. Uh, instead, what that means, you know, when we use expression in that other way, it's just a sign of something, basically. Um, okay, so, so, but in many cases, right, impulsion meets resistance, and so cannot get to it its end, right? It's, it's blocked um, by some circumstances. Now, if you're simply thwarted by the resistance, right, if, if that's the kind of resistance you meet, then you just end up frustrated, maybe even enraged, um, but there's nowhere to go. It just kind of peters out if it's a complete thwarting. On the other hand, the resistance might call out for thought, might generate curiosity, right, um, might in the end be a good thing, right? And so if we don't just let the impulsion sort of fade away in frustration, we must look for some um, medium uh, to further it, right? Um, now, um, the resistance that we're talking about, of course, can be, can be um, external, often is, but it can also be internal and intentional as well. You can, you can um, sort of, um, especially when, you know, as a mature person, you know the positive side, that sometimes comes from delaying impulsion for some further ends, right? Then you're going to want to redirect that impulsion towards some uh, alternative alternative means to your ends, right? Um, that's a that's what Dewey calls a medium, right? So the medium of expression is an is an alternative sort of material for reaching one's ends for acting on the impulsion um, when a direct sort of uh, uh, direct expression of the impulsion is blocked. Right? Um, and so, and so that's a, it's an alternative way to your ends, as I said. Now that the process, right, of using a, an intervening medium, um, it actually clarifies and reorders or reorganizes the impulsion itself, transforms it, transforms it from a kind of coarse and cohate thing to a conscious, emotion, right? And so there's a, there's a long discussion in the chapter of what an emotion is and how emotion works that is built on that idea. Um, and that clarifying ordering process itself involves sort of values and meanings from past experience, derived from past experience playing a role. And Dewey actually seems to say um, that uh, the process, the whole, this whole process actually doesn't even just reach the original 
kind of end of the um, end of the uh, original impulsion, but actually um, the end itself is transformed. And it's this whole picture that uh, gives you a kind of, that gives you what Dewey calls an act of expression. So in an act of expression, uh, impulsion becomes an emotion through the clarifying and, and ordering process that brings in values from past experience. Um, it, it mediates the original impulsion towards, uh, directs it towards a new end, um, which uh, sort of expresses the now clarified emotion in some sense. Now, in part three, uh, Dewey emphasizes the way in which an active expression is a construction in time, not instantaneous, right? You can see how that follows pretty clearly from the picture we've just been discussing. And Dewey expands on this um, in that same passage by saying, it means that the expression of the self in and through a medium constituting the work of art is itself a prolonged interaction of something issuing from the self with objective conditions, a process in which both of them acquire a form in order they did not at first possess. So there's kind of a there's kind of a back and forth between the self and the and the world, right? Through this medium um, that constitutes the the work of art. You, for example, you might think about painters, uh, how painters may repeatedly sketch. The subject of their work um, and the sort of the back and forth process between the hand, the eye, the page, you know, the medium uh, with which they're sketching, um, and all of that, right, um, sort of refines the, uh, the 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 work that's being expressed. Right. I mean, even sometimes that happens not in a sketchbook, but in in the imagination, in part. But that back and forth is still present in that case as well. Um, and so you see Picasso was a master of this kind of um, back and forth refinement of expressive form. And later in the chapter, sort of on the same theme, Dewey tells us that the work is artistic in the degree in which the two functions of transformation are affected by a single operation. As the painter places pigment upon the canvas, or imagines it placed there, his ideas and feelings are also ordered. As the writer composes in his medium of words what he wants to say, his idea takes on for himself perceptible form. Okay, so the, the, um, the thing expressed and the medium of expression, uh, there's a kind of back and forth between these. Right. Okay, now looking at the fourth point, right? This is about the, the store of attitudes and meanings derived from prior experience. This is another thing that Dewey expands upon in greater detail uh, a little bit later in the chapter. I'm just going to read this quote. Um, he says, Dewey says, each of us assimilates into himself something of the values and meanings contained in past experiences. But we do so in differing degrees and at differing levels of selfhood. Some things sink deep, others stay on the surface and are easily displaced. The old poets traditionally invoked the muse of memory as something wholly outside themselves, outside their present conscious selves. The invocation is a tribute to the power of what is most deep lying and therefore the furthest below consciousness and determination of the present self and of what it has to say. Right, so, so um, this is just an example of that point that um, past experience and the meanings, values, um, uh, ideas en encompassed in it, knowledge encompassed in it plays a big role um, in what is, done, what is done in the future. And this is true for the artist as well as for the perceiver. So, okay, so after all of this, we've been talking about the act of expression 
the what for Dewey is expressed in the work of art. He makes it clear that he thinks it's not in the impulsion. The original impulsion is not what is expressed. It gets things going, but as the artwork is produced, it gets refined into emotion, right? So is emotion what is expressed? And in a sense, that's gotta be right. Um, but also, the emotion is itself created by the act of expression. It does not um, pre-exist the act, right? Um, nevertheless, there's a, there's a sense in which Dewey says that the, the, that the art, the work of art does express emotion. Um, but he kind of walks that back as well. Um, on page 74, he says, uh, and this is a quote, just because emotion is essential to the act of expression which produces a work of art, it is easy for inaccurate analysis to misconceive its mode of operation and conclude that the work of art has emotion for its significant content. Okay, um, and so just continuing on on the next page, page 75, Dewey says, in the development of an expressive act, the emotion operates like a magnet, drawing it to itself appropriate material. Yes, emotion must operate. And so, in a, and so, you know, this is my aside. Um, there's, there is some sense in which emotion is is uh, expressed. Right? Um, Dewey says it is selective. Emotion is selective of material, and directive of its order and arrangement. But, and this is the other sense, it is not what is expressed. It is not the content of the expression. Right? Without emotion, there may be craftsmanship, but not art. Okay. Um, it may be present and be intense. Emotion again. Emotion may be present and be intense, but if it is directly manifested, the result is also not art. Okay. So the relationship from between the emotion and the expression is in some ways indirect, mediated. So then what is the significant content of the act of expression? What does the artist express? That's a question I leave with you um, to think about this chapter. Does Dewey tell us what is expressed here in this chapter? Um, independent of what Dewey thinks, what do you think the answer is? What is expressed in a work of art in, in schematic terms? Now Dewey refers to, to Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh in the chapter as an example of an emotionally intense artist. But with this intensity, Dewey says, there's an explosiveness due to an absence of assertion of control. And I think Dewey means that as a criticism of Van Gogh, that there's emotion, but there's not the kind of, there's not enough ordering of control. So when you look at um, these uh, works by Van Gogh, I wonder whether you agree with Dewey that there's a lot of emotion, but there's a kind of absence of control, which you might see as a defect in the work of art. Alternatively, do you think Dewey is being, in some sense, unfair towards Van Gogh? Um, would be the other question. So those are some of the key ideas I wanted you to get out of chapter four. Of course, uh, there are a lot of ideas in the chapter that I didn't touch on or go into too much detail on. Um, there's more ideas about emotion, about the creative process, in the chapter, even about the relationship of uh, aesthetic experience and religious experience. I didn't really get into that. Um, of course, also there may be some nuances of interpretation uh, uh, that I've missed or I've gotten wrong. Um, so, you know, let me know what you think about that. Um, I look forward to our further discussion in class um, on the discussion board or in the comment sections uh, of the video. So uh, that's it uh, for chapter four, and I'll see you soon.